Is there another Earth out there? I'm Jane Platt with NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory in Pasadena, California. The Kepler mission, launched March 6th from Cape Canaveral, Florida, is in orbit now getting ready to stare into space and look for planets like our Earth that might be orbiting other stars. Kepler project manager Jim Fanson of JPL joins us. Hi, Jane. It's nice to be with you. Well, even without uh, Kepler, astronomers had found more than 300 planets orbiting other stars, but none of them are like Earth. So Kepler is looking for planets like Earth. What exactly do we mean by that? What is Earth like? Uh, what we mean by an Earth-like planet is to find a planet that's about the size of the Earth and that orbits its star at Earth-like distances. It orbits a star like our Sun at Earth-like distances. And that means that it orbits at a distance from the star where the temperature of the planet is not too hot and not too cold, but is just right for the presence of liquid water on the surface, where you can have oceans, uh, you can have uh, uh, liquid water in which to have biochemistry, which we believe underlies all forms of life that we understand. So we're looking for a planet that could be habitable the way the Earth is. Which leads to the next question, which is what is the ultimate goal of Kepler? Well, with Kepler, we're trying to answer the question, how frequently do planets like Earth, that is, planets the size of the Earth and orbiting in the habitable zone, how frequently do planets like that form around stars in our galaxy? As you said, we know of about 350 planets now orbiting other stars. Uh, but finding planets the size of the Earth in the habitable zone is a, just a, an extremely difficult measurement to make, and that's what's driving us into space, uh, try to make this measurement uh, above the Earth's atmosphere where we can get much higher precision. Tell us a little bit about the technique that Kepler's using to look for Earth-like planets. Kepler is going to use a, a somewhat different technique uh, from uh, the method that's been used to find the bulk of the planets so far. We're going to use a technique uh, called transits, and uh, a transit is an easy thing to understand. It's simply a planet orbiting a star passing in front of the star as seen from our point of view so that for a few hours as the planet orbits, uh, it blocks some of the light from the star from reaching us. And we can measure that change in brightness or that slight dimming uh, for the period of hours it takes a planet to go across the star. And so the planet will reveal itself uh, by blocking part of the star's light and it does that once per orbit. Uh, and so by that method, not only can we determine the size of the planet uh, by the depth of the dimming, uh, but we can also determine the orbital period or how far the planet is uh, from the star. So there's a, lo a wealth of information that we can get from this technique. So obviously this involves some pretty sophisticated uh, technology. Um, tell, tell me a little bit about the telescope and how it, powerful it is and what it can do. And, Without getting into the, the nitty-gritty of it, just a little bit about how it works. To do a, a measurement of how frequently Earth-like planets form, we need to look at a very large number of stars uh, for a very long period of time. Most of the telescopes we build on the ground or we put in space, what we're trying to do is magnify things that are very far away uh, and very faint so we can get a very high-resolution look at what's going on in, in the distant universe. We have the opposite challenge with Kepler. We need a very large field of view so we can simultaneously look at a very large number of stars. So we've built a special kind of telescope called a Schmidt telescope, and the field of view is equal on the sky to two dips from the Big Dipper. So it's a, a, a hundred square degrees of sky. Or another way to look at it, our field of view is about 30,000 times larger than the field of view of the Hubble Space Telescope. So it's a very different kind of telescope, and, and it allows us to stare at a, a region in the Milky Way galaxy rich in stars and monitor 100,000 stars simultaneously for a period of years. Talk briefly about the camera on Kepler. It's a big camera. As I mentioned, we need to look at a large number of stars so not only does the telescope bring in this large field of view on the sky, uh, but to image that and to collect the data, we need a very large uh, camera. If you think of the detector that's in your, uh, your pocket camera, your, your one-shot digital camera, it'll have a, a CCD or a charge couple device in it that's about the size of your fingernail. The size of the focal plane on the Kepler camera is one square foot. So it's, it's 
physically extremely large. It's the largest camera uh, focal plane we've ever flown in space. Uh, and if you think of a camera you would buy for your your private use, if you have a really good camera, you'll have a few megapixels. Well, the Kepler camera is 95 megapixels. It's a, just a very large camera by any measure. Uh, you've been working on Kepler for a long time, as have uh, many people on the team. Um, it's really a nerve-wracking process getting a spacecraft launched and then getting it to work properly and getting confirmation it's working. You recently got an image with uh, millions of stars. Um, that must have been a really great day for you. It was a great day. You, know, we, we, you have a couple of critical events in the life of a mission like this. One of them is uh, you light the fuse on the rocket and you take this ride into space and you hope everything goes well. Uh, in the case of Kepler, everything went extremely well. Uh, and then in the life of a telescope, another critical event is you take your first image and you determine, uh, are you in focus? Uh, is everything working? Uh, you know, did you break any glass in the telescope? And, uh, and we were very gratified with our first light image to see these millions of stars uh, glittering across the focal plane. Everything was in excellent focus. Uh, everything was working as designed. Uh, it was a tremendous relief and very gratifying. Kepler is a three-and-a-half-year mission. Um, at the end of three-and-a-half years, what is your hope and what is the plan for what information and what knowledge we'll have that we didn't have before Kepler? At the end of three-and-a-half years, we should know whether planets like the Earth are common or rare in the galaxy. We don't know whether uh, Earths will be plentiful or whether the Earth is unique. Uh, and this is a question that has come down to us across a hundred generations of human history. And we stand uh, on a, a technology, finally, uh, that allows us to answer this question scientifically. So at the end of three and a half years, we're going to know whether there can be Star Trek in our future or whether there's no place to go. More information on the Kepler mission is online at www.nasa.gov slash Kepler. Thanks for joining us for this podcast from NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory.